evening and welcome to the February 11th Carson City School Board meeting. First item on the agenda is adoption of the agenda. So moved. Second. So we have a motion by Dawn, second by Joe. Any discussion? Public comment? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Uh, Trustee Creaney, will you lead us in the flag salute? Please join. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> <coughs> Thank you. Next up is Mr. Stokes with the superintendent's report. Thank you, President Walker. It's my privilege to uh, be with trustees this evening. I'd like to also welcome our guests. A couple of announcements from me. Uh, I'd like for the trustees to know, as well as those who might be watching on the television, that we have three uh, citizens meetings that are scheduled to talk about and to ask questions and to listen to information around the middle school attendance zones. Um, if you'd permit me, we have sent out an automated phone messages message to uh, families that reside in the Eagle Valley Middle School school zone, the Carson Middle School zone, and also the Fremont School zone. And uh, these phone messages were sent out both in English and in Spanish. And the first meeting to be held will be tomorrow evening at the Eagle Valley Middle School Gymnasium. That starts at 6 p.m. The next meeting will be the following night, Thursday, which is February the 13th, at the Carson Middle School Library, also beginning at 6 p.m. And then there's a little bit of a gap, but the final meeting will be at Fremont Elementary in the library, and that will be on February the 27th at 5.30. If you have any questions and want more information, uh, invite anybody who might be watching or trustees certainly to contact me at our uh, district office. I'd also like the trustees to be aware that tomorrow I received a, uh, a call from Mr. John Uhart, who is the um, Realtor who's been working with us on 1600 Snyder Avenue. The uh, phase two environmental study on that property has been approved and tomorrow they'll actually be doing radon testing and other airborne particulates as part of that. On the 24th of February, the uh, contractor who's performing the phase two environmental study will be taking soil samples and uh, be taking a look at any particular contaminants and or compaction of that area. So we're moving, and uh, I'll keep you updated as we learn more. I'd also like to, just as a reminder, let you know that on February the 20th, we'll be having our joint meeting with the Board of Supervisors, and that'll begin at 6 p.m. And then finally, I have received the letter that you all likely received by email, and I just wanted to let you know that I'll be following up on that. And Mr. President, that's all I have to report. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stokes. Uh, next up, we have board reports, and we this is for information only. We'll start with Abby from Pioneer High School. Hi. Okay, so for... The couple activities and things we have going on. First, we have our students and staff at PHS want to recognize pioneer student Katherine Nielsen, who marched with the CH CHS band in the parade in San Francisco last week, which is pretty cool. And then on February 12th, there's a ski trip club to Squaw Valley. I think that's how you say it. And then on <laughs> February 13th and 27th, we have rock climbing, and that's in Reno again. And I won the last one, and it was really fun, so I'm excited to go to those ones. And then we're just preparing for ACT testing for the juniors, and that's it. So thank you. Ginger from Carson High School. Hi. Last weekend, our marching band went to San Francisco and performed in the Chinese New Year Parade, and from what I heard, they did a wonderful job. Tomorrow night, FBLA, which is Future Business Leaders of America, is sponsoring 
a talent show, and it's at 6.30 p.m. in the auditorium here at the community center. And then the next day, Thursday, is a varsity skiing meet at Kirkwood. And then Friday, both basketball teams, girls and boys, girls being at 5.15 and boys at 7 p.m. are playing a games versus Douglas at home, and it's senior night. And then this week, for student council, student body officers are having elections, and next week is count class elections. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Stacy. Thank you. Um, just two things. Um, we had an emergency NIAA meeting um, since we met last about the uh, F the visas for the F4 international students, um, it looks like they're going to, we're going to settle out of, out of court. Um, although it's one of those cases where we really would like to fight, but it costs more than it will be worth it. Um, and then the other thing is we had another hearing on um, a three strike athlete. And this is my second one this year. And we're talking about freshmen and sophomores that are getting three strikes in our drug and alcohol policy. And vaping is the number one reason in, in the last one that we had in Urington. And I just wanted to say, especially since you guys are here, that we need to start doing something about this. This is turning into a real or epidemic. epidemic. And it's causing a lot of problems for a lot of people. And I don't think that people think that it's as serious as it is, but... The one that we okay, we actually gave the last one her um, eligibility back after a year, and she already broke it since um, December. So she's no longer being able to play sports at Carson High. And so we'll see how this Yarrington one goes. But this is the, the only the second time that we've had these 3X hearings. So I really want to put out the word there, especially for athletes, you can't vape, you can't smoke, you can't drink, and you can't do drugs. We have random testing, and in Carson School District, our test, drug testing is more, we do it more than the NIAA tells us we have to do it. So just heads up there. So I really, um, really want to get that word out. And if you, you have kids and you know kids, try talking to them about it. It's just, it's not a good thing. So, and I'll probably bring up more with Mr. Clario when he gets up here about it. And uh, that's it. Laurel. Um, I think that's a good message, oh, Stacy. Sorry. Somebody missed the Parks and Rec meeting. And, and I told Jennifer that I would do this. So on behalf of the Parks and Rec, they would like to thank you for your service, Joe, with this beautiful picture and a card and your nameplate. So I told Jennifer I would do this. I apologize for I was sick. I was late. So it's all good. Well, Laurel, maybe Stacy won't interrupt you this time. I was just going to say, I think that's really good advice to get out there um, to the kids to remind them that vaping is a serious um, offense like that. Um, for Fritch Elementary School, they would like to recognize fourth grader Noah Isaacson because last weekend at the computer science summit that the teachers went to, he went and taught the, te the technology teachers about technology. So they're really proud of the job that he did at that. Um, for Fremont Elementary School, they have their um, Apex Dance-a-thon fundraiser starting next week. And so I don't know everything that's involved with that, but that's going to be starting at Fremont. They also have Bingo for Books on February 20th at 530, and that will be their kickoff for the reading week, and their theme for this reading week is Reading is Out of This World, and they will be looking for guest readers to come in and read to the students. So if that's something that you would like to do, I'm sure you'll be contacted by all the other schools um, in the district when they have their reading weeks, but it's it's a fun opportunity to go into the classroom. And, and also they wanted to remind everyone that they are hosting a rezoning meeting on February 27th at 5.30. And then also I wanted to thank um, Dr. Ward to Joseph. Last, um, the end of January 30th, she took me on a tour of Fremont and showed me some of the really great things that they've got going on in their classrooms and in the, um, oh, I'm going to forget the, the life skills 
class and, and just gave me a really good tour. And there's a lot of really good stuff um, going on there. And I'd like to have you guys hear a little bit more about the power hour that they do, where they do intervention built into the day, which is really, um, it, it seems to be working really well for them. And it was, um, it was a great tour. So I really appreciated it. So that concludes my report. Sorry, I, I get so wrapped up in listening to you guys. <laughs> Dawn? <laughs> Dr. Uh, Lee Conley, principal at Eagle Valley uh, Middle School, has an update uh, for us uh, on their standard student attire. 58% of our parents that responded, that's uh, 318 total responses, to our standard student attire survey agreed it should continue at Eagle Valley. However, as 42% did not, and based on suggestions from parents for and against the uh, student attire, the following items are now going to be allowed at Eagle Valley. Blue jeans, gray pants, black polo shirts, and sweatshirts, and logos on clothing up to three inches in diameter. We hope these adjustments allow a simpler and more inclusive array of allowable clothing for all students, and these guidelines better match the uh, student attire guidelines of our feeder elementary schools. And then uh, at uh, Carson High School, the uh, robotics uh, team will compete uh, this weekend, this Saturday, for the Northern Nevada League Finals and the Northern Nevada Championship, which will be uh, all day at McQueen High School. And a little note, uh, they hosted a, uh, the last meet of the season two weeks ago, February 1st, at Carson High School, and they placed first. So going into the Northern Nevada Finals, uh, things look promising. And uh, lastly, Carson High School... Next Wednesday, the 19th, a week, a week from tomorrow, they're going to have what they call Options Night with a theme, Choose Your Own Adventure. And that's primarily for 8th graders, maybe 7th graders coming into high school. Uh, what they'll have is uh, basically the doors open at 5.30 p.m. And at 6 o'clock in the gymnasium, they'll have a kind of an introduction. And then they'll bro break into uh, sessions in the library and the two cafeterias. And they're going to be talking about uh, AP, Jumpstart programs, and CTE. So the uh, February 19th, uh, 6 o'clock, and there will also, one of the sessions will also be uh, in Spanish as well. And that's my report. Thank you. OK, for Empire, um, I had a report from Mrs. Squires, they went to a um, Title I conference. She took eight of her members, and they um, learned that they are doing the right things at Empire, which is confirmed by their outstanding performance. Um, they have a bingo for books night on Thursday from 5 to 7, and they do have quite a bit of active clubs, which is super exciting. They have chess club, STEM for girls, makers, uh, makerspace club, book club, a cleanup club, and then they're also collecting money for a uh, Kathy Bobber scholarship. Apparently, Kathy was a sub uh, for the Carson City School um, District for many elementary schools, and she was a positive a role model for the kids, and so they are um, collecting um, funds. Um, apparently, she passed um, away last summer. Um, if anybody is interested in uh, making a donation, they can just simply do that um, at the um, Carson City um, School Foundation. And then for Mark Twain, um, currently they are um, conducting the access uh, testing for the ESL students. And then they have the fifth grade um, leadership um, sponsoring a school-wide penny war to support patients with leukemia, which is a very nice cause. Um, Penny Award ends this week. Uh, PTO Jumpathon will be held during a special specialist class on Thursday the 13th. Valentine's Day celebration will take place this coming uh, Thursday on the 13th. 
and the ESL Parent Night will be held on Tuesday the 18th. That concludes my report. Thank you, Richard. Yes, uh, for Bordrick Bray, they're having their PTA meeting is scheduled for Wednesday, February 12th at 3.30 in the library. Then on Tuesday, February 18th, they'll be hosting their monthly Loving Solutions Parents class from 5.30 to 7.30 in the library. And they're also working on their standard student attire. They sent out surveys this, this week, and they hope to have the answers back by this end of this week. And uh, they put a committee together to um, work on this issue, and they invited me to be on the committee, so I was glad to do that. And they're also they're doing their access testing. Uh, they've been doing that last week and this week, and maybe into next week. For Carson Middle School, on uh, Tuesday, February 18th, 8th grade, 8th graders will be um, attending a CTE tour at the Carson High School. And then on Wednesday, February 19th, they're having their coffee with the counselors meeting again for the parents in the library at 7.30 a.m. And uh, I've already confirmed that I will read at Fremont. I got that email this afternoon, and so I confirmed that I would be reading there, and I'm looking forward to it. That's the end of my report. Thank you. Joe? Uh, thank you. Yeah, I got the email, too. I haven't responded yet, but I will. And if they fill up, I'll just heckle Richard. <laughs> you can come with me. <laughs> <laughs> you can do a duel. Right. Duel. There you go. Dueling read alouds. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Um, just a couple of things at the high school. Some of the stuff I had has already been mentioned, but there is a job fair. Um, scheduled for Friday, February 21st from noon to 3. It's going to be held at the community center here in Carson City. Um, they'll have job openings and internships available to people, and they ask that you bring your resume. So if you need a job, want a job, or want to change jobs, uh, nice opportunity. If you work for the district, don't do that. <laughs> um, Jumpstart applications are available for sophomores and juniors. Uh, they're due March 12th. Um, the prerequisite for Jumpstart is Algebra 2 or to be registered in it. Um, so if you have any questions, by all means, go to the guidance office, get your questions answered. And then just to piggyback on what um, Don said, options night, 219 or 530. You know, even if you're familiar with Jumpstart or AP or CTE, it's really worth going to and, and understanding what the current programs are all about. I've had um, three of my kids, one was on the AP track, one was on the Jumpstart track. Both did all the classes you have to do and both had great experiences. So it really is what's the best fit for your student or you if you're the student. And so I would just encourage you to go learn about it and uh, you know, don't think you know what there is to know about it because it seems to change every year with acceptance rates and all that stuff. And both programs are doing really well. So that's my report. Thank you, Joe. And I'd probably say on that note, you know, we're well represented because you're very knowledgeable on those options. And then also Lupe right. has a great deal of knowledge. So parents, teachers, students, you also have some trustees who know quite a bit that could be helpful. Uh, Sealer Elementary School on the calendar, I noticed they have Valentine's Day parties and birthday celebrations at 2 on Thursday in their classrooms. So I'm sure... That will be an exciting day for all, and I wish all the teachers and administrators luck on that day. It's always an exciting day. <laughs> and the custodians. Custodians, it's really about Christmas with the glitter. That's, that's when they get it. <laughs> so last week, uh, I attended the Council Advisory Committee. Uh, Mr. Stokes, uh, Ms. Fuson was there also, and... Um, we spent quite a bit of time reviewing um, the drug and, drug and alcohol policy that we adopted and revised last summer. And um, their number one issue that every site was reporting was vaping incidentally. And uh, one of the points of our discussion is, you know, how we took out where it said controlled substance to give the schools and the sites a little bit more discretionary you know, a little bit more room to wiggle with the new and improved things that kids come up with that we might not be prepared with. And so um, 
they're looking at our policy and they may come and request revisions in the in the near future. Um, we didn't quite get to that part, but where we left, um, they were going to meet with Ms. Fuson and um, discuss their concerns. And so we may be hearing about that again. All right, I'll move on to association reports. Loretta? <clears throat> Good evening, President Walker, Trustees Administration, and Renee. I'm Loretta Marson, VP of CESA. I got that in this time. I always forget that. Um, I would just like to report um, that CESA will hold their monthly meeting Wednesday, February 19th at 4.15 in the Carson High School Library. Valerie Clark will be there to go over the different options of insurance, and then the membership will vote on their choice and then let the district know the outcome. Um, CESA met with Dr. Delphin and A.J. Fueling last week to discuss our job descriptions. The job descriptions will go online very soon. Yay! And A.J. Fueling will get out letters to inform ESPs about their new titles in the coming weeks. And this was a huge undertaking by everybody. And we, CESA would just like to thank Dr. Delphin, A.J., and the district. Um, Huge, and it just again, thank you for working with us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other association reports? Seeing none, I'll move on to public comment. Do I have any public comment? Seeing none, we will move on to item number seven discussion on proposed changes to CCSD regulation 275 social school social workers. Safe School Professionals Program, and that's Mrs. Fuson and Mr. Clario. Good evening, President Walker and members of the board. I'm Tasha Fuson. Uh, for the record, uh, as you know, the original Carson City School District School Social Worker or Safe Schools Professional Regulation 275 was approved and adopted in August of 2017. Throughout the last three years, we've had a couple revisions. And as, as of late, um, we are bringing some potential revisions to you, some suggested revisions um, in accordance with Senate Bill 319. So to talk you through what those changes are, um, I'm going to turn over the mic to Mr. Calario, who, as you all know, uh, we are contracting with to oversee our social workers in our schools. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, members of the board, Mr. Stokes. Um, thank you, as always, for having me. Um, this particular agenda item, as uh, Mrs. Fusons did say, that, uh, that I believe this is the third time we're bringing this particular regu uh, regulation to you. And that's a very good thing, actually, because as the program grows, uh, uh, so does uh, the need to uh, clarify and to um, enhance what we're doing and what we will be doing in the very near future. Um, this particular um, regulation change that you have in front of you, um, the, the three key changes are moving away from the term that we've used from the onset, which is safe school professional or SSP. A couple of the main reason for that is um, that was kind of a starter because um, four years ago when we started our program and other rural communities were starting theirs, they didn't have the luxury, if you will, of having social workers or marriage and family therapists. Many of them had what we, you would call community health workers, um, other bachelor's level human uh, uh, services type folks. Um, there was also a notion, um, not widespread, but the notion that, uh, well, why are you calling them safe school professionals or your school's not safe? And we did not certainly want to give that, that impression. Um, but I think the thing that helped us, uh, SB 319 that Mrs. Fuson just spoke of, uh, that was passed in this last legislative session, actually um, uh, solidifies and addresses all the um, job duties and um, requirements, not only of school social workers, but school psychologists um, and school counselors as well. Um, we believe that we have are in line with that. Those are a little bit more general. Um, so we want to start using the term school social worker. 
Um, the other change we're making is the term school mental health worker. And a school mental health worker, um, and of our uh, 13 school, uh, uh, school social workers, uh, if you will, uh, uh, one of which is a school mental health professional, and the definite, uh, excuse me, the school mental health worker. And the definition of a school mental health worker is somebody other than uh, someone having a social work degree and license. So, uh, for example, it would be a marriage and family therapist. Uh, they don't have a social work degree, nor do they have a social work license, but they do still have a professional degree. So we certainly wanted to indicate that. And then the big change, again, due to um, SB 319, and that is one page three, outlines there are 17 um, requirements that are in that particular statute that uh, school social workers and school mental health workers uh, would um, do in their day-to-day -day duties. And um, we kept in some of the other things. Um, uh, we took out quite a bit of redundancy on page four now that we have what we've added on page three due to the regulation. But we kept in a couple of other specific things that I think are very important. For example, uh, the fact that um, our social workers um, and uh, uh, school mental health workers still do suicide uh, screenings. They still do uh, abuse and neglect uh, reporting with these CFS and a few of the other things that you have here. So we just thought this would be a good time to um, make these revisions in our um, regulation. And if anybody has any questions or comments, would certainly entertain those. Just a couple things that um, typos that I noticed that I'll just go through quickly. Um, in the first paragraph, um, after the bold school mental health workers hereby, just uh, correctly spell that one. And then um, this, uh, the second bold, the third bold, bold paragraph that starts with SSW, um, it, the MSHWs are plural with an S, so I'd, I'd make it plural that SSWs must possess True. as well. Um, and then on page four, the very last paragraph, um, all SSWs and SSMHWs must adhere to district. I don't think you need a comma after district before requirements, including, so I think you could delete that comma, district requirements, make it complete. And then the very last sentence just needs a period. Um, on it, on the very last, on page five, the very last sentence. Um, and then just a question I had back on page one, where we define what a school social worker is and then list who's eligible to be employed as one. And then we jump to the um, school mental health workers. Would it be help? I think it'd be helpful to spell that out again, just like we did for that. But I'm also wondering if it would be, wouldn't be helpful to have a definition of what a school mental health worker is so that there's parallel between the two um, sections there. Thank you. Very, very helpful comments. Thank you. Any other comments, suggestions? No? Thank you. Okay. I guess I do. Sorry. Oh, Trustee Barner. On the last page, um, I'm just wondering, comply with all district safety and security rules, including but limited to the site registration, sign in, et cetera, et cetera. I want to make sure that I'm to say uh, comply with all district policies, regulations, you know, including, if you wanted, something like that. Okay. Including the safety and security rules. And then, uh, I, I know you got to have a lot of acronyms, but there's a lot of abbreviations throughout both these, uh, the regulation and policy that was kind of distracting when I read it. But I don't know if there's any way to change, change that because I know that a lot of acronyms. Okay. I'll talk more about that when we get to the next page. I mean, the next uh, next agenda item, the uh, presentation on the social workers for the three years strategic plan. All right. Anything else for item number seven? All right. We'll move on to item eight, presentation of CCSD social workers 
three-year strategic plan to include data collection on suicide prevention, screening, and referrals for the first semester of the 2019-20 school year in accordance with Assembly Bill 114, AB 114. Discussion only. Again, good evening. Tasha Fuson for the record. <clears throat> um, kind of in being parallel with what we did earlier this year with our counselors um, when we changed the, the district regulation to reflect their updated duties. And now, again, the changes uh, suggested for 275 to update our social workers. In addition to that, um, Mr. Calario has been working closely with our school social workers to really kind of lay out and define a, a three-year plan for things that they would like to accomplish within our district. Our counselors, again, did the same thing earlier this year. So one of our, our tasks that we've been working on is really trying to to help define the difference between a school counselor and the roles and responsibilities in a school social worker and um, how they work together in a partnership to provide supports to our students and our families. So Mr. Claria will go through the, um, the three-year plan that they've developed. And in addition to that, um, there was some legislative updates, Assembly Bill 114 and Senate Bill 204 that require us as a district to report to the state on our suicide prevention and intervention um, training that we're providing to our staff, as well as students, and then the number of incidents that have occurred in our district. So we'll go over some of that data with you as well. Mr. Clario. Thank you, Ms. Fusant. For the record, Dave Clario, um, school social worker, program manager, and consultant with the Carson City School District. I apologize, I didn't say that in the first agenda item that I did. Um, if I could break this out in two parts, um, please. Um, one is the overall three-year strategic plan. And then the second half of that will be a little more detail specifically on suicide prevention and intervention uh, planning, some things we're currently doing and other things that we will be doing. Um, so as Mr. Fuson did say, um, a part of this is um, I'm honored and blessed to be with the uh, school district for four years, but I know there will come a day perhaps that I may not be here. So I wanted a blueprint for um, our staff um, that and a plan that um, would kind of pave the way and doing that over a three-year period kind of incrementally where we might be at that particular time. Um, so I'll just point out a, a few things, one here. Um, certainly I uh, wanted to take on page three our school district mission statement, which I believe was a quote from Mr. Stokes right from the um, uh, from Mr. Stokes' pen, if you will. Um, also the um, school district school social worker vision statement the three-year planning period, um, because we, uh, as Mrs. Fusen did say, we, this has been like about a three-month uh, endeavor um, that we've been meeting and working these out in um, a, a PLC, uh, a type of environment, professional learning center environment, um, and uh, breaking our uh, uh, social workers out by their three levels in which they work. And then I handled the, if you will, overall district plan uh, for the whole school district. So um, the only exception to the first year starting in this uh, next school year in August will be the suicide information and data collection and training that we are undertaking as we speak. So that will be the only exception to this. Um, page four does talk about that in um, uh, year one, objective one, about that we shall comply with um, AB 114 and Senate Bill 204. Um, and I'll get into that in just a little bit of detail in just a moment. Um, uh, again, AB 114, which is a lot less detailed than two, uh, SB 204, 114 requires that we keep data and we do training um, for the staff, if you will, at schools. And specifically, it breaks it out to um, uh, principals, uh, to teachers and for those schools that have them, um, stu uh, student resource or school resource officers. Um, 204 is a little bit geared more towards the students, very specifically those students in grades uh, 7 through 12 um, uh, will have to receive um, uh, training on suicide prevention. Um, the rest of this, for example, um, the safe school professional uh, term becoming obsolete, I give some detail on how we will do that. 
Um, the next one is um, CEU training for our social workers, which is very key. Um, CEUs through the, or continuing education through the Board of Examiners for Social Workers is very, very different and actually a little more difficult than perhaps teachers that get theirs during professional development days. Um, and it's more based on hours, if I, if I understand that correctly. So um, I'm working to make sure that our social workers do have that opportunity during professional development day that I could bring in somebody from the community um, that is credentialed to be able to to provide even if it is two or three CEUs for them and help them with their licensure. Uh, the next big district uh, one, and I'll only go through this, the district one on uh, one, one like this, not the individual uh, schools or levels, uh, just for the sake of time. Um, objective four of five uh, would be that we would like to hire more clinical social workers or LCSWs. Um, all of our current social workers are master's level with a non-clinical license, but they do have a social work license. Um, the difference between a licensed clinical social worker and a licensed social worker, for example, a licensed clinical social worker can diagnose and treat mental illness. And uh, ultimately, that's where we want to get in our schools because that will help us with Medicaid reimbursement. Um, I don't currently have an LCSW, but three of our current uh, school social workers are LCSW interns. Um, we were very fortunate to have, I believe our school district was the second in the state to be um, certified as clinical sites for all our schools with the support of Mr. Stokes and uh, Mrs. Fusen um, and uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, Kima, who's no longer with us. Um, I was able to expend some time in doing that work. So we're going to home grow these folks, and certainly we would like to retain them. Um, another issue is going to be financially re uh, uh, reimbursing them fairly, uh, because currently the way the setup is, a LCSW would make the exact same amount as a non-LCSW, and they might be lured once they get that to go on to more traditional mental health settings. Um, but that's something uh, for another step that we will certainly work on. Um, and then the last one, was um, on, I briefly mentioned, Medicaid funding that we will be looking towards and gearing up towards becoming a Medicaid-funded site for all 10 of our schools for the school district. We still have infrastructure to do. Um, we have funding uh, needs and infrastructure needs. Uh, for example, um, I had submitted to Mr. Stokes and Mrs. Fuson a, uh, I would want to say humbly, kind of a, a comprehensive detailed report on my findings and recommendations recommendations. Um, I followed Medicaid. Um, I was their uh, mental health uh, statewide coordinator in the 90s and early 2000s. And although a lot has changed, I wrote a number of their current regulations that have certainly been updated over the years. Um, but Medicaid requirements are very complex. They're very comprehensive. And we would have to, for example, hire a part-time medical director, which would be a, PA, a, a MD psychiatrist could be under contract. We need at least at least a half-time LCSW to administer the program who would have to sign off on care plans, who would have to assure that prior authorization and continuing stay authorization are met. Um, we definitely want to do this and we need to do it, but we don't have the infrastructure right now, but hopefully we'll, we'll work towards that. And that's a little bit what Objective 5 talks about. And then the rest of this first half or part of, of this presentation, uh, the next few pages gets into um, uh, objectives and strategies to meet those objectives at each of the three levels, elementary, middle, and high school. And um, you will find a lot of consistency in all three, for example, addressing chronic absenteeism. Um, not just addressing the absenteeism, but the behaviors that lead to that, and primarily with the parents. So um, we have a few that are specific uh, to levels and some that are not. Um, if folks can get these done earlier than 
the, for example, the second or third year into the first, that would be welcome. But this, again, is a blueprint, and it's guidance for, for our social workers moving forward. So I just kind of wanted to go over the, and uh, give you kind of a general overview of this 12-page strategic plan. We've never had one. Um, we would appreciate, you know, any comments or suggestions. And even if you didn't have them right this moment to digest, you may. Um, to certainly let us know, but um, I allowed the social workers largely um, in their schools to help devise those at their levels and with some coaching and, and mentoring that way, just so you know. So any questions on this in general, and then I'll get into the meat of this, which is the suicide-related information. So we'll go Laurel and then Richard. I, I do have a couple of questions. A um, couple things I wanted to point out. Page four. Objective two, the second to last sentence where you've got endorsed school mental health workers, just capitalize the H on health. Um, and then a question on page seven for the objective with the SISP on, under objective one. I just didn't know what SISP that acronym was because it hadn't been defined in the strategic sure. plan. And then later on in the same section, there's SSPs again, and I'm guessing that may be a holdover from the former. Um, so it's 1.1 and 1.3 and 2.1 have SSPs in there. So that's what I was thinking that might be Thank something. Um, and then again, page 8, the SISP under 4.2. I just I, I don't know what that acronym means. Um, and then page 10. Objective 4, 4.2, consistently monitor attendance data to inform tired interventions. I'm sure they're tired of monitoring attendance, but I'm thinking it's probably tiered, tiered. there. Mm -hmm. So um, that was the one that I caught there. Then I just have a question on year two with the objective, um, that there be at least one licensed social, clinical social worker in each of the three school levels. Um, is that for every school, or is it just like one for each level? And I guess my question to that is, how does that fit within our budget concerns? Um, and what if we lose grant funding for this position? Because that, that kind of has me a little bit concerned. Thank you for those questions. Um, and you are correct. The, the grant funding is uh, to every two years. Um, this is currently the uh, second year of that. So um, we would look towards uh, uh, funding from the Department of Education. But you're absolutely right. And that gets back to the importance of Medicaid funding uh, sooner than later to kind of home grow and um, to, from within, um, uh, have that, that as a resource. The LCSW, we, we have several options with that. And that would, again, assume that the three that are currently interns would have their LCSWs. One would be one year from now. The other two, I believe, would be in approximately 18 months. They have to have 2,500 clinical hours total. Um, I don't think it would be meant to be in each school because then we would we would probably have to double our number of uh, school social workers from the current 14 um, to allow that to happen. So the thought was at the very least, at the very least, if we had three or four and had at least one in each level, uh, the administration would need to decide whether that person would rotate in those um, uh, in those levels. Uh, clinical work is maybe about a third of what social workers do in schools. So we're not saying we want to turn our schools totally into mental health centers. So, but two thirds of the work uh, social workers do are truly non-clinical. Um, another option could be to put those that all they want to do is see maybe eight to 10 students a day and they don't want to do anything else with supportive administration. Another option could be to put them in our school-based health centers. Um, and they would see, uh, uh, you know, uh, students and families that way. Um, so there are a couple of options, not real, real specific to that, um, that, that we would have to work with. Um, but hopefully first get them to get their LCSWs and that uh, they would stay with us and give us some of those options. And we would certainly obviously be interested, it, once we bring this to you too, what your thoughts might be, kind of where our resources at or the time and, and what they're able to do. Yeah. 
I think it's important to note, too, that this is simply an internal document. This isn't a document that's required by the state or even as part of our grant. It's it's simply a document and a plan that our, our school social workers um, and Mr. Calario got together and put together to kind of drive the work that they're doing within our district so that they themselves would have a direction and some accountability and um, some goals that we're, we're setting forth so that we can support our schools and um, and their school performance planning. So that was one of the pieces that um, when we planned and discussed about what this would look like, making it very important that um, our school social workers were meeting with and um, discussing their plans with their um, site principals to make sure that they um, went hand in hand with what the site principals were doing um, and what the site leadership teams were doing in terms of developing their school performance plans. Mm -hmm. Very good. And Mrs. Crossman, just so you know, and thank you for like that acronym, uh, SISP is Specialized in Structural Support Personnel. It's essentially anyone other than a teacher or an administrator in a school. So for example, it would be school social worker, school counselor, school nurses, school uh, psychologist. So thank you. I will make sure to spell that out. Thank you. Any other questions or comments, uh, Mr. Werner? I thought law enforcement had a lot of acronyms, but after reading this document, I'm not so sure. Um, I'm wondering on page four, objective number one, you have the Carson City School District, and I'm wondering if we should, in parentheses, put CCSD, com, uh, parentheses, because you refer to it as CCSD throughout some of the other places in, in the document. Okay. And then on page five, objective 4.1, it's on the qualified LCSWs will be interviewed and if appropriated, should it be if appropriate? Appropriate. Mm -hmm. For the position hired. And then again in 4.2, you again spell out Carson City School District, and I don't know if you're going to use CCSD throughout the whole document after you use it that one time or not. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, continue on. I think this question may have been answered, but I just had the same question as um, on objective number five. The 10 schools within the district will apply for and be approved by the Nevada Division of Health Care financing and policy for Medicare. Is that an automatic approval if we apply for it? Because that's kind of why I read it. If you apply, you get approved. We, we would not be automatically, we would apply, and if, if we approved. meet the requirements, uh, Medicaid has about seven chapters that would relate to this. So, uh, yeah, we would have to apply, and I could reword that, apply yeah, just, and meet the Medicaid requirements to be approved, something, be yeah. Okay. All right, then uh, on page seven on strategy, objective two, strategy 2.3, each, oh, each site will be required to provide self-care based activities on site on at least one ER deed per year. I'm wondering if we shouldn't use early release date, so a day, so everybody knows what you're talking about. Okay. I know, we all know, but I don't know if, I'm, you know. And then the same on objective three, on strategy 3.1, all school staff on a PD day, maybe we should put professional development day. Okay. And then, let's see. Again on page eight, uh, strategy 5.2, you have, um, we'll dedicate one PLC meeting per school year. I wonder if maybe again we should use Professional Learning Community Day. And then on page nine, um, you caught one of them, Laurel, but on strategy 3.2 at the bottom of the page, there again, it's tired and sort of tiered. Okay. I was tired. <laughs> <laughs> Darn spell check. <laughs> well, it, you, 
That's Thank the you. tough thing with it when yeah. it's a real word. Spell check doesn't <laughs> touch it. There's two three point twos there. Oh yeah. It goes three point one, three point two, three point two. Yeah, that's a good yeah. catch. Okay. I didn't catch that either. And I'm just curious too on page eight, objective number four. Develop a standardized set of policies and regulations for chronic absenteeism at the elementary school level. Are we going to do that for the middle school and the high school too, right? Yes, they do have um, uh, something in there as well. Yeah, um, I thought both, they yeah. Did, so. yeah, all three schools. What we, or excuse me, levels. What we tried to do is keep it consistent. Uh, Mrs. Fuson wanted, uh, which I wholeheartedly agree, consistency amongst the levels. Um, so each of the, um, I believe, restorative practice and um, chronic absenteeism was most consistent amongst all three levels, just slightly taking different approaches, so. I think I'm done, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Clario, I would say, you know, this is really important work, and I think the document shows you guys are putting a lot of work into it, but one of the takeaways I had is just with all the acronyms, yeah. it takes away from the communicating what the point is, and I think that some of those like when you have those bulleted lists, you don't necessarily have to list the acronym of who's going to do what because a lot of those it's pretty well assumed who's going to do what. And okay. so I would just kind of, if I were you, I would probably look at limiting that and kind of mixing it up a little bit because you kind of get an alphabet soup when you're reading it yeah. and it takes your brain to a different place. You're not really looking for meaning. You're trying to backtrack if that makes sense. Okay, I, I appreciate those uh, fresh uh, set of eyes. Would you then, there's a couple of ways to handle that. Either spell out a lot of the acronyms, although I know generally you say spell it out the first time, acronym in parentheses, then use acronyms, and or just like you say where I could eliminate them, the assumption would be the social worker would do it. Maybe that to do that approach more. Okay. I'm just thinking that would clean it up because I think it's pretty clear that the work is kind of interchangeable for who you have in your school, right? I mean, people have one person regardless of what their, their designation is. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Just, uh, I don't know if this one was pointed out on uh, page 11, objective three, uh, you have 4.3, it should be 3.4 there. Oh, okay. Thank you. Should be reversed. Thank you. Stacy? So, so mine are more general questions. You brought up the part-time medical director and the part-time LCW or whatever mm -hmm. that alphabet is. Um, what, do you know what cost would be associated with that? Did you give that information? Um, well, we're not quite there yet uh, in, in, in knowing what the cost might be. I mean, I might be a little bit more to an, a full-time LCSW who is not who would be willing not to do clinical work, but they have the clinical background. I mean, depending upon a lot of it is based on uh, where they, are they starting out or in the tenth or fifteenth year, are they with a big organization or a small one? I mean, it could go anywhere from sixty-five to 70,000 a year and up, um, probably a little bit more than that. Um, psychiatrists, uh, you know, typically make, again, MD psychiatrists, I'm just going to say very generally, it could be anywhere from 150,000 a year to a, with a very small organization to 200 or 250 in a very small piece. Um, I don't think we would need much of their time, but Medicaid would require them to oversee the work in a kind of a global sense, the one before that would be the LCSW, um, who is signing off again on various documents and, and some of the oversight that way. Um, so yeah, so we'd be looking at, you know, probably a full-time LCSW, a very, very small portion for the medical director piece, 
you know, any other logistics, um, assuming that we might have to pay LCSWs just a tad bit more. But also, um, LCSWs are not the only ones that would provide Medicaid reimbursable services. They would provide the majority of them because, again, a lot of it is clinical. However, non-LCSWs, many of our um, MSWs, which is a master's degree in social work. So the MSW is the degree, the, L uh, the LCSW is the license. Um, all of our social workers could provide case management services in which you do not have to be a clinician, and those would be reimbursable. But again, Medicaid has kind of strict requirements on those. The other healthy challenge is, um, and I, I would think there would be some flexibility for Medicaid, is they have yet to define a a quality assurance plan or oversight or auditing that they would do. Uh, they have acknowledged, and that was a, a question that I asked uh, at, at one of their board meetings or hearings, is what guidance would they give? They will give general training, but they don't have the mechanism because they also do not have the funding to hire somebody to kind of oversee all of this. So I hope that answers your question. So if it's reimbursable and Medicaid, about what percentage of the expenses do you think would be covered? Of what we currently do, you mean? Or, or what, what we currently do, and then if we added these positions, what, what added would there be? Added well, if we, if we built up to the uh, what I'd call the um, infrastructure, both uh, financially and um, just structurally, either you staff we have or, or, or I would say right now the majority of what is covered case management we would probably be okay with. Um, if we included the, clini the clinical part, Medicaid covers 10 clinical parts. That would be, again, that would be, for example, the clinical assessment. It would be diagnosing. It would be a psychometric where it's more of a screening, but a little more uh, a psychometric leads to a clinical assessment, leads to the care plan, leads to the documentation. We would also have to make relatively significant tweaks with documentation, how we document, um, how we do some of the services to comply with Medicaid's requirements. So it, it would be hard until we really have Medicaid's QA in place to see exactly what they want. But one of my recommendations in the, um, in the um, evaluation I, I did was that if we did start out, it might take two years, um, at least a year, maybe two. Um, and again, that's how administration, the ideal thing would be to find seed money or upfront money, be able to put this money into the program. And then within a couple of years, once we started getting reimbursement, it would more than pay off for itself. And hopefully down the road, help us to sustain this. Because you're right, the, the grant, it, this is now four years. We're hoping to get at least two more. But at some point, grants aren't meant to be forever, as you know. And we have to show sustainability. And this would be one way to do it. So, But we would have to really, you know, and, and Medicaid would be willing to meet with any school district. Um, that is interested in doing this and answering very specific questions on the duty, the infrastructure. For example, right now the school district does do Medicaid billing, but it's for IEP students only, and it would be like physical therapy and speech therapy, but the behavioral health piece uh, would bring in a totally different realm to that. So we'd have to make significant uh, changes in what we're doing. So. Do we have a deadline for reporting the AB 114s, the, the 17 things that you said? You yeah, and I was going to actually go into that if this is okay, a good time. Later. Thank go you. Ahead. No, thank you. Was there any other? Uh, I appreciate everybody's comments, too. These are very, very helpful. And I will um, uh, take this all to heart and work on this before this is released. And as Mrs. Fusen said, we weren't required to do this. Um, you know, this is just something that's the right thing to do, to give direction. I think we're to the point that, 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 uh, that we're continuing to grow, and this blueprint, I think, will help keep everybody online, and we're going to pay real close attention to it. So thank you. And I also think it helps the public understand that there's a difference between our school counselors and our social workers. And that line gets real blurred at times until we had these on. And even when we had the school counselors 
and got rid of them in the elementary level and everybody was solved. So I think it's good for the counselors and for the public and for the social workers. So I appreciate your guys' work on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so the second half of this particular agenda item is geared to AB 114 and SB 204. So um, one document, if I could uh, draw to your attention, please, is this one pager here. Um, and this actually, I was looking, because I know um, when, I think it was about a year ago when I presented to you, you uh, folks uh, very aptly stated, you know, we'd love to see data at some point sooner than later. Um, so during the summer, I had kind of put together a schematic on data to collect. But then when it was um, not only confirmed um, by legislature and in statute, but also it, it confirmed what exactly is needed. So I think we're pretty much covering everything. What we would have done had AB 114 not been passed, um, but I think it's a nice compliment. So for example, AB 114 requires us specifically to document three things. It requires us to document students with suicidal ideation or suicidality, which is a little bit more objective. Uh, the other thing, two things that it requires are students who attempt suicide, and students who actually commit suicide, which are certainly a lot more um, uh, uh, attainable that way. So um, we added that, or I added that, because that's the requirement of AB 114. Had AB 114 not come about, it would have been those two top columns that we're going to certainly keep. The total number of suicide screenings by the Carson City School District, and this could be their safety team. Most of these screenings are done by social workers in the schools, but it could also be done by a, um, a school counselor or any member of a safety team. Uh, the screening is a simple six-page, uh, excuse me, six-page, six-question. Uh, uh, if a social worker, teacher, if somebody feels the student might be exhibiting suicidal behavior, either something they outright Right said, I'm going to kill myself, or more indirect things. My family might be better off without me. Um, you know, uh, uh, I have nothing to live for, those kind of things. Where the social worker or the safety member of the school is going to do the screening. From that, based on certain questions that are answered yes, if after that screening the social worker or the safety team member feels, yes, my, my fears are confirmed, I think they may be in fact suicidal, then we refer it to a community partner. And most often, and, and I give the break out the acronyms here for you, uh, uh, Carson Tahoe Behavioral Health, for example, um, and then um, the other on this list by breakout of school is individual therapists that are kind of joining in and, and working with us that way. And this, by the way, no matter who does this, it's no cost to us. If this, the family has insurance, they'll go ahead and bill that. But this is a community service for us, so I think it's a huge uh, community endeavor. Um, the clinical suicide risk assessment is something our staff do not do. It usually takes an LCSW or a P. PhD psychologist. They both have the same rights at what they can do. And they will diagnose the student for um, uh, a clinical suicide risk assessment. And as you can see, approximately one third of all the general screenings are referred for a clinical suicide risk assessment. Now, that number, as we speak right now, um, we're defining suicidal ideation by the referral to the community partner that actually does this, the assessment. Um, however, there have been a few other instances that uh, that a referral to a community partner wasn't needed, that this child was um, acutely suicidal, homicidal, or danger to self to others, and that's key criteria to be admitted into an inpatient psychiatric hospital. So if they need to go, they needed to go. So I am working out um, with the definition of uh, suicidal ideation with our staff, and I'm starting with our uh, Carson High School, uh, because uh, they have done, as you could see, uh, both they and uh, Carson Middle School uh, uh, by far and away have had the most of these uh, screenings. 
So that's AB 114, and we're collecting this data on a quarterly basis. Um, I am responsible for doing that. I have a spreadsheet that I send to the social workers. I require their quarterly report to be due by the 10th of the following month. So for example, by April 10th, I'm going to get the first quarter, which is April, uh, which is January, February, and March, so on and so forth. Um, then I compile a report and a list, and then that goes to our administration. Um, that we could keep monitoring this. And this is the first time we've actually formally done this. So August 19th was the first day of school, and then the last quarter we did was December 31st. AB 114, one last thing I'll say in it. This is a key part of how we have to comply. And the report, I believe, is due by March 13th. Uh, it was at the report. March 14th. Or oh, March 14th, 14th. yeah. So... Um, uh, it, but I think the fact that we're, we're hopefully at or a little bit ahead of the game, that, that the, the hope is that the Department, of, uh, uh, de uh, Depar the Department of Education will be appreciative of these efforts that we're making, and I've had feedback that they are. The other key component of 114 is the training that I mentioned. Um, and that, again, has to be provided to those three disciplines specifically in the schools, teachers, site administrators, and if they have them, um, the uh, school resource officers. As we speak, as we speak, I am currently working on a curricula for that. Um, we're looking at putting that in a PowerPoint and putting that on our um, e-learning portal, which um, our staff could go online to do that. I'm working very closely with Mrs. Ann Sear, who's our um, Director of Risk Management. Uh, we would include at least maybe one or two videos on that particular curricula, as well as maybe a test or exam or quiz, just so folks are kind of following through with that. Um, so um, my commitment, and we're also looking at existing modules, um, at which are good, but um, I want to make sure that a big part of this training will be our Regulation 270, which is our Carson City School District um, suicide prevention, intervention, and postvention. That's going to be interwove into this curriculum no matter what we use. And my commitment, knowing that also with that date looming about five weeks, is to have this to Mrs. Sear by the end of this week. I spent a fair amount of today working on it, and probably I'm about three quarters through it. So that, in a nutshell, is AB 114's requirements. Any questions or comments to that? So one thing I want to also um, inform you of is that we did not receive um, the reporting format from the Department of Ed until last week. So it came in last week. That's why it's not on that form. Um, and luckily, uh, we did have the foresight, I guess, if you will, to start collecting data. And we did meet with our suicide intervention prevention team uh, to take a look at both of these bills and to, to review our current policy and regulation to make sure it was um, current and in alignment with those two bills. And then also to, again, discuss how we'd start at least collecting some of this information. We were waiting on the state to develop the training for staff. Um, they have not developed that as of yet. So that's why we're developing our own. And then when we received notice last week um, that here's the form that you have to report on, and it's due by March 13th, um, needless to say, we were a little surprised. I did call um, our uh, Department of Ed folks and asked for clarification on that because the way that we read the bill was that we would be reporting on the incidents for this entire school year. And of course, my my question was, how can we report on incidents for the entire school year if you want the report on March 14th? Um, so what we decided to do in terms of consistency is to simply report on first semester. We're going to collect second semester data. We can send an amended um, a report to the Department of Education. They do have to report to the legislative body. So that's where they're trying to collect their information. So. Um, Next, during the next school board meeting, you will have this information on the actual um, paperwork that we're going to submit to the state. So you'll see it all together. Um, as um, Mr. Clario was stated, there's two different bills. So the, the bill that refers to student training, which is the Senate Bill 204, 
Um, we are working with our sites on this one as well. So currently within our high schools, students are provided signs of suicide um, training. Uh, it is, is given to all ninth graders at Carson High School. Pioneer High School did the training with all of their students. Um, and the two middle schools, they're providing that to their sixth graders. Um, so they have completed those trainings at all four of our secondary schools. Um, so we've collected that information and that will be in the report that you have on our at, during our next board meeting as well. So we have complied with the student training portion of that. And we're choosing to use the signs of suicide um, uh, curriculum and training simply because that's what we've used in the past years and also um, what the Department of Education a department of oh, oh, Office of Suicide Prevention is that the um, Amber Reed's group. Oh, oh, uh, the, let's see the Office of a Safe and Respectful Learning Environment. That was that was the program that they were suggesting and supporting as we rolled this out in our district. So that's what we've provided to our students thus far. Thank you. I think I'll speak for all of us and say that this is something that we're all concerned about and for whatever reason in society youth are kind of looking at this as an option which it shouldn't be so it's important work it's unfortunate work and so thank you and everybody who's on the front lines dealing with this so we appreciate you okay thank you any other questions or comments on ab 114 or sb 204 i think you were good identified and outlined that very well that one thank you Thank you. Great. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is item nine, discussion and possible action to approve the renewal of the contract of employment as superintendent of schools with Richard Stokes for the period of July 1st, 2020 through June 30th, 2022, increasing a salary to $173,189 per year beginning July 1, 2020. And this is for possible action. So I guess I'll start. Um, Mr. Stokes had requested uh, or offered to stay on an additional two years um, at the end of his contract um, to kind of help get us through the bumpy waters ahead. And uh, Mr. Cassiopo and I met with him and Mike Pavlakis last week. And uh, I think Mr. Stokes, if, I if I'm correct, to quote him, he's happy with things currently as they were, and he's happy to stay on. And I think that looking at um, his salary over time and comparing it to increases that other employees have had, he generally does not enjoy those same benefits. And so we thought that it would only be fair to offer him an incentive for staying. You know, he's he's offering additional time to us and away from his family when he could be home getting paid to watch football and fish with Cyrus. So um, that's kind of the salary increase I just want to say was um, Joe and I really looking at things and kind of thinking that as a board we needed to reward him for his hard work and certainly his superb leadership of our district. Are there any questions? Or? So the one question I have, so the percentage that he's getting a raise is the same percentage that we've given to the employees? Well, we kind of figured it out as is there were years that it was like 1% the other groups got. Some years there was 2%. And so we tried to, what our attempt to do was to go back and to fill in those gaps, the increases, he didn't get, and then also to kind of match the collective um, bargaining that we had given the other groups. And so it that was our attempt of what we were trying to do. We were trying to match with what we have currently negotiated last year with our different groups, but then also to go into those past years when he did not receive an increase. Just... To confirm, he has not received a salary increase since 2016. Is that correct, or did you go further back than that? I believe you got an increase in May of 2017. Yeah, or June. Okay, I was going June with the date here of, on that. Yeah. Okay, so 2017. Yeah, that was 
And so since I turned off my mic. So I think that one of the things that I, ha I guess I had always assumed when we get those agenda items and give the assistant superintendents and uh, department heads their cost of living increases or to match what our other groups are getting, um, Mr. Stokes has not traditionally been included in those groups. And so as a trustee all these years, I've always thought that he was receiving those same benefits and he was not. And I think looking back, that's probably not quite fair. I know that he's trying to save the district a little bit of money, but we do try to reward everybody for their hard work equally. Yeah, I have a few, a few things. Um, when this first came out and hit the agenda, I got several phone calls from uh, different people that were a little bit upset uh, because it looked like um, the contract that was used was a 17 contract, and it looked like uh, he was in, uh, Mr. Stokes was in for a $32,000 a year raise, which is not accurate, and I want the public to know that. Uh, he's currently making 160000 if I'm not mistaken, and so there would be an 8.2% raise to 173000 I truly believe that uh, you've been a valuable asset, and we're glad that, I'm glad you're going to stay. But I would like to just put out there that, uh, you know, the classified staff and the certified staff, they received a 2% raise per year. You last received your raise in June or July, probably, of 2017, a $19,000 pay raise. I think that we ought to give some consideration to sticking with the 2% for the last two years as what we've given the classified and certified staff. And so I think that we ought to maybe give some consideration to that. And at a 4% raise, if you go back the last two years, that'd be about a $6,400 a year pay raise versus a $13,000 pay raise. So I wanted to throw that out to the board's consideration and discussion. Trustee Varner, I'm wondering, so then when you look at those past two years that he didn't receive those, but then we've also negotiated 2% increases going forward for all of the groups, which he has not benefited from. And so that's what his contract is a little different from our other negotiated agreements. And so we want to look at that. That's It's kind of a hard thing to do because... We're trying to be fair, compensate him for the work, which it's an impossible job. I mean, I know we all go to umpteen events, and he's at every single one of them. And um, so we're trying to be, to fill in that gap that he didn't get those past years, but then also looking forward for what everybody else is going to be getting as we move forward. Right, and we understand that, but it has to be explained because the way that it's out there with we have the first news thing that comes out is we have a $2.6 um, million dollar deficit. And then the next news thing is is we're giving that Mr. Stokes is staying and he's getting a raise. It, it, we're just trying to look very transparent. And we have all said year after year, Mr. Stokes, that you're at everything, and we appreciate your hard work. And, and um, one of the reasons I ran is because we thought you were going to retire, and I wanted to be here when we did the superintendent search. So um, I'm not saying that we're, that we're against it. I'm just saying I just wanted some transparency to let people know how exactly you guys came up with that number and what had transpired, because it makes it look like, well, we're going to give this, but now we're going to go cut this program. And I know that that's not the, the the look that Mr. Stokes wants either because he's taken cuts at times or hasn't taken the raise. Like in 2017, it was going to be greater, and he wouldn't take it at that time because of the financials. So I, I think it's well-deserved. I just needed to have some transparency there. And, and in fairness, Ruthie, would you do me a favor? Yeah. That microphone is still on. Yes. Would you turn it off because we're getting feedback? In fairness, Mr. Stokes is a very humble man, and he asked, he didn't ask for an increase, but Joe and I, representing the board, had thought that it was fair to try to bring, bring him the same benefits we had negotiated for others. And so I don't think that 
he's sitting over there saying, if I don't get an increase, I'm walking out that door. I mean, this is Joe and I, we were on our own trying to figure out how to make it equitable as much as possible. And there's and, not a lot of information. And as a board member, we appreciate that. Mm -hmm. we, we think that that's very thoughtful. And that's kind of why we're the board that we are is because we do look at that and we look at equity throughout the district. So we just wanted transparency. But we appreciate the work you and, and Joe put into this to do this. Thank you. No, thanks, Stacey. Um, you know, just to add, and I apologize, I came in on this topic just a few minutes late, but, you know, Mike and I met with Mr. Stokes. Um, we had the district attorney there as well, and we were talking about the history of it all. And, real, and, and we're, we're, you know, we're weighing this on not just the increase that we felt he was due, as everybody is due, but then we're looking at the other districts. We went back to 2018, 2017 to see where we're at. And, and you know, you can argue for or against any of this. But just general information, if you go back to 2017 and you look at the 14 districts that reported their superintendent's incomes, the average, if you had those districts together, was right around $163,000 a year in salary, base salary. Mr. Stokes was, was a bit under that. 2018, he was more in the middle. You know, really what we're trying to do is we're look at, you know, we're, we're, we're the capital city in a state. <laughs> We have a lot of rural districts. We're considered one of them. But we ask our superintendent, you know, we're big enough to do a lot of things, but small, small enough to not be able to do a lot of things. And Mr. Stokes, his job starts, as do a lot of our teachers. My wife's a teacher. I get it. From the moment they wake up in the morning to the moment he goes to bed at night, um, he does a lot of things that are over and above what we expect him to do. And in the end, you know, I went back to 2008 when he had a, his salary there, he had a salary negotiated. He went four years before his next contract, 2012, still didn't take a salary increase. Four years later, we finally bumped him up. The man went eight years without a salary increase. Then we bumped him up. Then it, and then we get to where we are now. In 2017, he's at the salary he's at now. Hasn't had an increase since then. And now what we're trying to do is bump it up. And we really shot for 2%. When you do the math and look at it, when you add everything in, it came out a little above 2%, but it wasn't like we're trying to give him a, you know, a huge raise. It was incrementally a little over 2% a year. Did you, I was going to say, did you do a cumulative, the 2% cumulative, 2 so it does cumulative. end up being more than 6%? For Correct. This. And when okay. you do it that way, you know, 2% from this year to next year, yeah, it's a running, it's, an, it, it's, a, you know, it's a cumulative total that gets you to where we are now. And as we found out with the searching for the executive director for NASB, the, that salary there is going to be very important to the type of people that we're going to get in here for his replacement too. So I think it's really strong feeling to show that our board is supporting our superintendent. So I do appreciate that too. Well, and, and something else to consider on that too is when you look at the longevity of all the superintendents in the state, I don't think there was any of them, and correct me if I'm wrong, that were had over three or four years of experience. Mr. Stokes has been a superintendent for 12 years. Yeah. Probably one of the longest ones. Yeah, and there's still several superintendents in the state that make more than he does, and he's by far the most tenured superintendent we have. Um, so I think, you know, when you look at that, you look at other perks some superintendents get, like some get vehicles. He still drives his van around to check the snow totals. Um, <laughs> So, you know, he is, he is a humble person. He did not ask for much. We, we kind of took it upon ourselves to say we think this would be fair. And, uh, you know, I don't think it's perfect, but I think it's, it's justifiable. And I know there could be some people out there saying, well, hey, I think that might be a little more than, than I made or my group made. And depending on how you break it down, whether or not you're looking at PERS, it, it could be a little bit, less, certainly less than a percent. But... It's, um, you know, we felt it was justifiable given what he does and where he's been and what he's contributed. Well, and, and Stacy, we did. Part of our discussion um, with Mr. Stokes was also in the fact that with only a two-year plan, we are looking towards success. And we're afraid that not to compensate him fairly for what he's doing, that's going to eliminate some people from even looking at our district. And we're, we're going to want a talented superintendent in two years to kind of take the helm and 
we need to make sure that we're looking forward in that respect as well. I don't disagree either, but uh, I'll just go back to, um, you know, we're in a budget or going to be in a budget crisis. And some of the people who contacted me, you know, they were quite upset. Uh, and I think they won't be so upset now they know that the pay increase is not as large. But I'm wondering if um, he gets an 8.2% raise this year for uh, for next year, I should say. What about the year after? Would he be eligible for another? This is this is a salary for. That'd be for the two year yeah. period of time. That's that's why it's a little bit different. Is you kind of have to put it all in there. Okay, just just a quick question because I was reading contract on page four, compensation eight, um, a it's one hundred and seventy three, one eighty nine, and then B says for the twenty twenty one or the twenty twenty one twenty twenty two. I feel like I'm saying too many 20s there, um, that he'll be paid the annual base salary and it'll be increased the same percentage as the annual base salary of the super. So will, I guess my question is, we're raising it for this, which in my opinion, in my mind is is making up for, if we raise it to the 173, that makes up for the three years that there wasn't. And then for the next contract year, it goes up the same as the administra as administrator's Increase. That's what we put okay. in there so that he we didn't get into the same situation where, where everybody in the district is getting one thing except okay. for the superintendent. And and I think that that thank you. I think that that's the important thing to realize is that um, the superintendent's contract is separate than all of the other employees, and so he does not receive those. But because of the nature of our work and his work, it's not something that we bring his contract up for renewal every year to adjust him with raises. So um, I, so I'm, I'm agreeable to this. I, I For all the reasons um, that you guys have set forth, I think it's important that we um, compensate him not only for th the tremendously successful job he does for us, but also to um, maintain our competitiveness when we're looking at um, hiring a replacement and um, to realize his level of expertise and experience is significantly greater than the vast majority of superintendents in the state. You know, it, it's it's related but unrelated to this. You know, when you look back when we redid the salary structure, you know, and we had where we bumped up the starting salary in the district to be competitive to forty thousand dollars a year, that was a considerable jump. Considerable jump for some, others kind of missed that boat, and there was some contention there as well. And it's. It's challenging to to make everybody happy. You know, I want to be fair. I want it to be equitable. I think some could say, you know, hey, I think that might be a little bit too much. But I think when you look at all these factors, you know, I don't think we're being unreasonable. I mean, in the end, you know, he's a he's a person who has about nine hundred people he's responsible for, not to mention all the students, and and the guy gets less than a three percent raise a year. You know, in most other professions. You know, there would be negotiations a lot more often than that. So. And then just for clarification, is that the only change in the contract? I, I read the date. Well, I mean, benefit-wise. I mean, is it just a salary or were there additional benefits added? I don't think so. Oh, sorry. No, everything else, my understanding is everything, you know, remains the same. Yeah, nothing else changed. It's It's... AJ, did I miss anything? Has anything else changed in the contract besides that? I don't think so. No. I think the one thing, I think one other point of our conversation was I think this year Mr. Stokes uh, benefits from longevity pay. Is that correct? Or last year you, longevity pay might be the thing that's not in there, but that's okay. everybody in the district everybody gets benefits. that that's been here 10 or 15 years or longer. Yeah. So, uh, Lupe or Don, do either one of you want to weigh in on this? Sure. I would echo what um, the, tr the rest of you trustees um, indicated already. I believe in fairness, and I believe in equity, and I would concur that he is an amazing leader for the district. Um, he, like you guys mentioned, is at every event possible um, here in the district, and um, he's been very inclusive, and I know that he has been um, making um, a greater impact on our Latino community. Um, 
since I, you know, uh, since I remember, because I've been attending quite a few meetings uh, prior to my involvement with, as a trustee. So I feel that he's very, very well deserving of this increase. Don? I, mean, I, I see this. This is one employee and the total little over $26,000 to the district. Maybe $13,000. Right, 13000 a year. So an extra $26,000. Where our other 2%, you're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars, if, if not more. So, I mean, I mean this, is, this, is not a, this is not a giant number. And he's been excellent. And like I said, it's modest, and, yeah. and it's not Mr. Stokes being greedy. It's, it's us trying to compensate him. So if, yeah. if there's no other conversation, I mean, this is a discussion, uh, uh, action item. I move that the Carson City School District Board of Trustees approve the renewal of the contract for employment with Richard Stokes as superintendent of schools for the period July 1st, 2020 through June 30th, 2022, increasing his salary to 173189 per year beginning July 1st, 2020, including other revisions and amendments to the language of the contract as presented. Second. All right, we have a motion by Laurel, second by Stacy. Any further discussion by the board? Just a comment to the, um, you know, we ran a few numbers up here, but if anybody have, ever has any question and you don't know it exists, you can go to Transparent Nevada and it lists virtually every public employee in the state's salary. And you can check up on what you know what other superintendents are making, what Mr. Stokes and others are making, and it, you won't find anything for 2019, but 2018 and farther back you'll find it. And it's pretty good information because it not only lists what base pay is, it shows what some of these folks are making in additional pay, and we're just and we're just increasing a base pay with no other additions. So um, you know when you look at some of that, some of these people are making quite a bit more than that. So it's really. I think reasonable, but you don't have to trust our numbers. You please go on there and take a look at it. My only comment would be don't just type in superintendent because it'll bring up about 12 pages of information. Type in superintendent of schools. It'll narrow the list for you. Any other discussion by the board? Dr. Rich? <clears throat> Excuse me. I'd just like to say uh, thanks to the board for entertaining the discussion. Uh, that issue was raised to me by several people that I wanted to bring it forth to the board for discussion. I support Mr. Stokes, and I will support the raise. Thank you, and takes takes a little bit of bravery to ask those tough questions, Richard. So thank easy. you for doing but no, so. But it's important. Any yeah. public comment like to discuss this issue? Right. Seeing none, I'll call the question. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you for staying. Congratulations, Mr. Stokes. <laughs> uh, thank you to you folks. I appreciate working with you. I, I value the um, consideration, and I thank you for uh, your support. Um, I love Carson City. It's a great place to live and work, and I'm grateful to be able to finish my career here. Thank you. All right, we might we might say in the next couple of years, you asked for it, Mr. Stokes. <laughs> uh, next item on the agenda: presentation and discussion on the development <coughs> of the tentative budget for Carson City School District for fiscal year 2020-2021, for possible or for discussion only with AJ Fueling. Good evening, trustees. Uh, Andrew Feeling for the record. If you remember, uh, at our last meeting, I presented um, the kind of first blush look at the budget for projected budget for next fiscal year. Um, and today, uh, well, it didn't. Um, sorry. There we go. Um, no, I got it. Uh, 
it didn't look uh, great. Um, there was a, a significant uh, number that, that didn't look great. So um, uh, today, coming back with um, kind of really a, a preliminary high-level look at how um, we may, um, I guess, uh, high-level ideas as to how to take care of that and make that number look better. Um, if you remember, this slide uh, was from the last presentation. It's the, the exact same so, slide. So um, again, looking at last year, or I, I'm sorry, the current year, um, and the, the number of items that were removed from the budget in the current year, trying to get down to almost a $2 million deficit. Um, looking into the new year uh, right now, we're looking at about a $2.4 million deficit. There is some increase in, in revenue, which is, uh, certainly helps, um, but the increase in expenditures um, more than offset that difference. So again, high level, and the, the, in, the intent with this, um, instead of getting into um, significant detail, I think is to uh, tell you that there's been a lot of time and activity um, meetings with our principals, directors, um, taking into account a lot of information and trying to find um, some some uh, some way to reduce what that that deficit is. Um, so when looking at uh, a lot of information across the district. Um, these are what what has been come up with as uh, possible solutions, and again, very high level. Um, and we're trying to. Or we'll be getting much more information as as we near the end of this. Uh, or we approach the uh, tentative budget. We'll have better information, and of course, as we get towards the final budget, we'll have the the best information we have at that time. So. When looking at, um, there's really kind of four, tried to categorize it into to four areas. Um, and first, when looking at enrollment or caseloads across the district, um, and I should say this is uh, uh, general fund and also um, special education fund. If you remember, um, the, the general fund has to make a large transfer into the special education fund each year. So, any, any potential um, changes in caseload that could um, uh, lead to, uh, if there was not a need for additional staff to manage that caseload, um, that actually benefits the, the general fund. So based on that, there are six positions, uh, potentially identified certified positions um, currently that could be reduced um, and classified positions. There are three currently identified. Um, reduction is due to expected attrition. Um, basically, resignations or, or retirements that are expected. Um, there are two certified positions currently that we feel may not have to be um, filled. Uh, grants, so I have to give uh, a lot of kudos to Valerie Dockery and Mrs. Fuson, who have been in meetings uh, quite a bit. Um, we, we have, as you know, Mrs. Dockery has a talent um, for managing a grant and is in incredibly creative um, in trying to find ways to, um, I guess, help this situation out. So. She has identified um, 8.5 uh, positions that uh, can be absorbed into various grants at this time, um, and then also to uh, classified positions. Um, the last category, uh, what I would call reorganization, but basically unfilled vacancies and potential RIFs, so there, um, and RIF being a reduction in force. So certified positions, there are um, five we are looking at, and 12 classified positions. 
So clearly there's been a lot going on trying to sort this all out. And, and again, trying to, to keep this high level um, without getting into too much detail, there, there's, still, there's still a lot of work to do to fine tune some of this. Um, but when, when looking at that, um, and of course my pointer doesn't work, but all of that, that work and time, um, again, the, the, the principals and directors were um, fantastic in, in trying to help us sort through all this, um, and Valerie, <clears throat> Valerie Dockery. But in, in total, that is about $2.55 million worth of, of um, uh, reductions that could be made. Um, that is more than the deficit that we were projected. So I think, um, I guess what I'm hoping to get across is that a lot of work has been done. We have many ideas, many potential places that, um, you know, it, trying to minimize impact on the, I guess, the overall operations of all the things we do in the district as much as possible. Um, we're, we're basically not only at the number, we're past it. And so um, there's more, more talk um, that needs to take place, um, trying to look at are there still other options, maybe less impactful options. But um, I guess trying to make you aware that um, a, a, lot of the, a lot of the hard work is done, and now there's still more to go, but we're on a good path. We still have... You know, it's the first meeting in February. Uh, tentative budget is presented at the first meeting in April. Uh, final budget isn't approved until the last meeting in May. So we still have quite a bit of time. Um, and we are working to make this better. Just one, we just get that $700,000 grant for STEM. Does that help any of these numbers? Potentially, um, so that's you know one of the in all this clearly there's a lot of staff impacted um, in all of the discussions the the options are are as these positions come up it's where else might there be a, a position that that could be filled um, so that there is a, a position within that grant from Tesla over the next three years, and that, that is one of the options that we've talked about. And then just for clarification, so in 2020, it's the ones in red are the reductions, and then in 2021, those are the ones that were that you showed us before on the blue screen. Correct. Those are the ones we okay. made last year. That, oh, okay. 2020 is the current fiscal year. Yeah. Okay. Right. It, everything you said was correct. Thank you. Yeah. It's not even As 9 always. yet. And then the other thing is, if we have to riff, what date is that that we have to look at that to riff? So for me, the um, earlier that we decide on which positions, the better. So it um, gives our staff uh, places to look for within our district first to find uh, jobs. We. Uh, have a deadline of letters of intent to be out on May the 1st and then be back by May the 10th. I do want to up that date a little bit and um, get the letters of intent out earlier in March for our veteran uh, staff, certified staff, and then for our probationary staff, keep that same May 1st deadline. And that's to get the ball rolling as far as people that may be on the fence about uh, leaving the district for one reason or another. And so i um, hoping to get that data earlier this year than later. And then we're going to have the RFPs for nutrition. Do you see any cost savings there for the, the next contract? Um, possibly, but I, I would say um, not not significant. I mean, there, there may be some. Um, one of the things we've seen this year with um, the, the expansion of the breakfast programs at Fremont and Mark Twain, 
um, ha- have brought in an, an incredible participation from those schools um, that, that I think is uh, definitely helping the program. So I'm excited about that. Um, I, I'm not quite sure what will come back from the RFP as far as a guarantee. Um, but I, I, I would say with some confidence that I don't believe it would be worse. So, I, you know, there wouldn't be a surprise to that side. If there was a surprise, it'd be to the good. So, and, and, I, and we will, the, currently the plan is to have, um, to bring the, um, uh, I guess, the award uh, to you for consideration uh, at the first meeting in May. So it'd be before the final budget is due. So at that point, you know, there, there's still some negotiation, but we would, we would have a final number um, that we could plug into the budget at that point. And um, still, if it improves things, we would we would have it built in. And there's still no appetite to take those employees in the nutrition and put them with the service that we go with, right? We want to still, there's still an appetite to keep them as employees of the school district. Um, as far as I know, I mean, we, we haven't had um, discussions about that. Any other questions, Joe? AJ, thanks. I mean, I know, you know, a lot of the information I'm getting, emails and whatnot, are, you know, there's some of the principals are talking to staff, maybe all of them, about, hey, we got some, you know, budget crisis ahead kind of thing. And it is, it's a challenging thing. But people are starting to speculate and rumors are starting to fly. And, you know, some of the emails I've received, you know, they already know what's happening and we don't know what's happening. So I think we have to be careful, maybe not just in what we say, but spreading the word and making sure people are aware mm -hmm. that right now this is high level, you know, preliminary stuff. I mean, we don't have none of this holds a lot of weight yet. Mm -hmm. um, and like I've said before, and I know they're intertwined. You know, but I, you know, I really want us to look hard at our operational costs, you know, and see what we can do to, mm -hmm. you know, cut operational costs with before we start, you know, cutting staff costs and whatnot. Um, and I know that's hard to do because a lot of them are, okay, if I get rid of this, it involves these people. Um, the other thing, just a question for you is, last school board meeting, Dr. Delphin, I think you said, on average, every year, we're like around 20, 22 people that generally announce are going to retire. And just round numbers, I don't know if you have it now, but I'm guessing, you know, those people who are generally at the higher end of the pay scale, you know, probably costing us about, with salary and benefits and all that combined, one point, one and three quarters to $2 million. And then if those are replaced with, say, new hires at, 40,000 plus benefits. I mean, is it safe to say that could potentially be about a four to five hundred thousand dollars savings it, if it was that simple? Sure, it, it's possible. I to to some extent, um, an expectation of that is is built in already a little bit into the budget. Um, but at the same time, um, it, it's it's interesting. So, um, this last year we saw some savings um, from the staff from the prior into the new year. The year before that, it actually, um, I, I think it about broke even. And so one of the things we, we recognize all years of service now with certified staff. Um, and so that that definitely has has made a difference. Um, but I, I, I would think that over a longer period of, of time for a sample size, it's probably more, much, still more likely we would have a savings year to year because of that turnover rather than have uh, an increase. So, um, but yeah, that, that definitely is in consideration. And um, uh, as, as Dr. Dolphin, you know, each year, it seems like between the, the two new orientations we have, we have about 90, 80 to 90 new people in the district. So, um, you know, in, in any given year that, that could generate substantial savings, just having new folks. And so, yeah, that's definitely, definitely being considered. Could you go back to the prior screen? Yes, sir. Please. Would the plan be to take some of the certified staff and classified staff and you can have people retiring, right? Mm -hmm. 
not fill those positions, but keep the existing staff who's not retiring on I, on uh, staff still? Uh, so I, I guess let me clarify sorry. that a little bit. Okay. The people who are retiring, right? Can the these fill? Could they fill these positions here that are going to be rift? Instead of you know laying somebody off, oh, just taking consideration. Sure. Sorry, those people who are retiring. Yeah, absolutely. Not Can I take positions. that one, Mr. Fueling? Yeah. Oh, do you mind if I take that one? Uh, Jose Delphin, for the record, uh, Trustee Varner. It really depends on where and what position they retire from. So, you know, at at worst case scenario, if I have you know twenty special ed teachers that are leaving, that's not going to really help us very much. Um, versus folks that are easily uh, able to be hired. So it, it's hard to tell, to be honest, for right now, how that's going to work out. In a perfect world, yeah, that would be awesome, but um, it never truly is that way. It isn't an exact fit. Um, I, I am hopeful that we'll get a smattering like we usually do every year from... Uh, all subjects from uh, elementary and uh, specialties as well. Um, and one of the main reasons I, I do want to push up letters of intent is to get the flow moving instead of waiting for the last minute. Not that that's going to prevent anyone from uh, turning any of their letters of intent later, but at least gives me and the district a little bit of, of more of a heads up as far as what vacancies we may be looking at. If someone, I'm sorry, if someone signs a letter of intent, are we obligated to keep them on payroll, even though we may have to lay somebody off if there's not enough people retiring? Typically, the answer would be yes. Uh, if they sign a letter of intent, then we're offering, offering them a job for the following year. Well, but our negotiated agreements also have provisions in there for reductions in force. And so that's when they'd work with the district office and the union and go through that process. Laurel? Just just for my clarification, because I, I understood this, and I just want to make sure we're, like when we're talking about reductions due to enrollment and caseloads, those would be positions that we just wouldn't need to fill. So we wouldn't have to budget for those. Is that correct? Pretty much? Correct. And then the, re the expected attrition is retirees that we wouldn't need to replace and absorbed into grants or people not losing their positions but then coming out of the general fund and being paid for. So really the only potential rifts are the 17 at the bottom, possibly. Is that correct? Um, I think Mr. Stokes uh, wanted to speak to that. Oh, did you? Okay. Thank you, thank you, Mr. President. So even in the slide before this one, um, we saw that there was this $2.4 million deficit. We didn't just think we had to meet that or, or come up with the $2.55 million to, to try to meet that deficit. What we did is we went and spoke with our directors, with our principals, with our supervisors, and we actually went through classroom and grade level by grade level to see, hey, if we have a fourth or a fifth grade class here with 19 students in it, can we do with one less teacher? And then in that school, uh, when we take the average of maybe three or four classes, maybe the numbers are now at 25, which is still a good sized classroom per teacher. Whereas you know, the number before may have been less than that. And so, so we, we didn't really go about trying to say we've got to have X number of staff members. We really did try to look at what are the numbers, what are the conditions. Uh, and if we look at the secondary schools, we offer a lot of electives, for example, at our secondary schools. We just do. And not all of those elective classes are filled. And so rather than reducing or cutting out programs, we, we said to ourselves, what happens if one of those teachers happens to retire or is leaving, can we just not have that particular elective and add more students to the other existing electives that are there? And so 
we really did try to take a look at what makes sense. Um, we appreciated the grant funding aspect of this. So because of the fact we have that grant fund that needs to be spent before a certain time, uh, and in some cases, those grant funds have to be given back if they're not spent. So that was another place where, again, thanks to our staff, we were able to make some modifications that took those positions out of the general fund but still allowed us to keep the program. So, so at every turn here with this particular process, we've, we've tried to look at things that we knew were meaningful to the district, that were meaningful to the schools, that were meaningful to the folks in the community, certainly to our staff and to the board. Um, but, but we also wanted to couch all of this work in the fact that other things will happen between now and the final budget. And we'll, we'll keep sharpening the pencil. We'll keep trying to say, can this replace maybe one of those staff members up there? But our goal really is not to do harm to the district, but to live within the means that we've been assigned. Well, and I think, you know, this is one of the things that I keep saying, and I think it needs to be said, this is, we have a very full school district. We have a successful school district. And I think that we're being forced to really live within our means in a way that's going to impact our programs and what our schools look like. And I think that people really need to talk to their legislature mm -hmm. uh, members and let them know, you know, this funding, if it stays the way it is, this is your one. You know, we still have negotiated agreements with increases in pay. We still have step increases and column increases, and those are going to cost health insurance. Health insurance. I mean, there's a number of items which are only going to make this matter worse as we go to year two, three, year four. And so, really, we need we need to hope that our legislature comes through and takes care of the districts that aren't in the top two districts. Yeah. size wise Tasha. Okay. president walker if i can address um a, a statement made by trustee cassio well, Tasha, if you sum for the record i also want to note that while the board has your time frame for approving um, the budget for our district our schools and our principals are still having to plan ahead for next year so when you stated, for instance, that sometimes some of our teachers have some information, and we have to be very careful about that, we do. But also when we're looking at, for instance, in a secondary situation where we're doing course selections at this point in time, as, as uh, Superintendent Stokes mentioned, if we're, if we're actually eliminating some elective courses, then there's questions that come up for that. Um, and then as they're building their master schedule. So I want you to know our secondary schools will be in master schedule building mode in March and April. So they have to plan those schedules without those people. So the folks that we've put on the table, we've had those discussions with about not replacing potential retirees, et cetera. They're having to build schedules around that and they cannot wait until May to start that process. So just please note that there, there's still work going on in those realms. And I think our, our principals are being very mindful of that, um, but, but also trying to make sure they take care of the things that they have to take care of. Oh, and I appreciate that. And I, I didn't mean to say that people are haphazardly going about this process. I mean, but what's happening is I think we're it's fairly concrete that, hey, to, to get from A to B, this is what we know now and this is how we have to proceed. I think we have to do that and that's important. I just think people are getting nervous because they hear from somebody else, hey, this is happening over here and all of a sudden, you know, maybe it's happening over here too. And I don't know how we get around that, but I just, you know, rumors are starting to fly was my point. Yeah. I'm just curious, how many uh, teachers on special assignment that are non-grant funded do we have right now? As of this year or going into this budget planning for next year? I guess for now then probably what we're going to have going into the next budget period. So I think currently we have three general funded um, curriculum coordinators. We have um, some teachers on special assignment in the elementary schools as um, a specialist, literacy specialist, but that's required under the read by grade three. Um, the curriculum coordinators are going to be moved to grant funding for next year. 
Um, and then we we are paying for part of the salaries of our literacy specialists from some of our grant funds as well to cover the overage that the the um, RGB three uh, funding did not provide. So so they're kind of mixed in there, but we've significantly reduced the number of teachers on special assignment as you saw in the one um, screen. We've already reduced nine, um, and what that means is unfortunately as we cut back that infrastructure of support for our teachers then the workload goes on to them. So for instance, I, uh, new standards are rolled out every seven years for different areas. So next year, the state is looking at potentially rolling out new standards for English language arts. So we will have to, to figure out what that looks like, K-12. And if we don't have, for instance, a curriculum coordinator for English language arts, that means our teachers would be left on their own to to do that work and then the work that we've done for race to the top our 10 million dollar grant for race to the top that work would surely start to dwindle away because there would be no infrastructure of support to make sure that happens we currently actually have 417 i'd look this up 417 unique courses in our district so 417 courses have to have course maps common assessments etc and that work is, is facilitated by a lot of our teachers on special assignment working with their colleagues in the classroom. So, and then as well as our, our new instructional materials and the support of training for instructional materials and access and we're a one-to-one -one district as you all know. So the technology integration and without the infrastructure of support for our teachers, then they're literally left on their own or our principals are tasked with providing that. And we know that our principals and our site administrators are already stretched thin trying to cover their, their roles and responsibilities. So I think it's important to keep in mind, again, sometimes those people behind the scenes, they seem, the scenes, they seem like the first people that we'd want to cut. But in reality, all you're doing is transferring more responsibility to the classroom teachers if you don't have that structure support for them. I think on that same note, I think that what you're looking at as we get tighter and tighter going forward, everyone's going to be doing more work. Our principals are going to be having extra, extra late nights. Our teachers are going to have extra late nights and long weekends. And certainly our district staff are going to be in the same boat. So we're hoping not to have to go down that road. So, I mean, optimally, AJ will work his magic and be our hero. And on that state commission, talk some reasoning into everybody. But in reality, I mean, what we're looking at is everybody having quite a bit more work and possibly our schools having a harder time meeting the needs of our students because we have less and we need to do more. So and, that's the reality. And we've been blessed the last couple of years or the last 10 years when other school districts had to cut things and because of the work that everybody did here and the associations and working together, we had a really nice ending fund balance that could absorb a lot of this, and we've come to the end of that. And so there are some tough choices and a lot more work to be done. But And I think that's why the rumors and the panic, because they haven't had to go through that while the rest of the state has been because of that, that bonus there. But I would hope that we could have a little transparency when you're since you're stepping it up and earlier if you could kind of keep us in the loop because we do get those phone calls and those people wondering you know what's going on and and we can direct them back to you but just to let us know that that's when you did it so that we can when we know we're getting these floods of emails we'll know why and and just you know i mean this this is a problem that we're we're facing and almost every other rural district is facing with the way the funding's looking at, at being placed. And, and I'm thinking back to the statistics that we just reported for one semester for school social workers and, and the needs that schools need to do so much more in addition to educating the kids. And we're required by law to do that. And I, I think members of the public, members of the community, everybody needs to start realizing it costs a lot more to ed provide the education that we expect our children to receive than what we're receiving from the state to do so. Well, and even starts at the federal level yeah. at that yeah. point because our state isn't getting as much as it, it needs to either. So that's with the, the federal uh, elections coming up, we need to be pretty vocal about that too. Yeah, you know what, what's interesting, AJ, and you presented it last time, and, and to... Uh, 
President Walker's point, you know, we, we need to, you know, more than hope our legislators will do something. They're not going to do anything unless we, you know, we choke them. And, and, you know, honestly, <laughs> we need to sit there and just flood them with, hey, these are the concerns of the districts. And you can't, you know, you can't chop us off at the knees and, because we're the rurals. But that's what they've chosen to do. And you put up a slide, I think it was last board meeting, where we talked about per pupil allocations that we get. And over, what was it, 11 years, maybe 12 years, we've seen a $900 increase per pupil. I mean, there's obviously funding education isn't on anyone's top priority. And we need to find a way to make that a, a priority. And I know some people will have different ways you can do that. But we really need to put pressure on our legislators at the state and the federal level to say, hey, Enough's enough, you know, quit padding your wallets and let's take care of education and the other needs. So there's my soapbox. Well, I had the opportunity to speak to the uh, assemblywoman this weekend and uh, expressed, you know, the dire straits that we we're in and basically got no response back. Not like we'll look into it or nothing. And she was a really nice lady, but there was really just no response from her. And and to be fair to her, though, she was providing professional yeah, development so and was uh, and was yeah, instructed was to keep yeah. her duties separate because that was her day job, not her legislative job. So. So certainly, AJ, you have you have a very tough job, and I know that there's a lot of work going into this and. Mr. Stokes and I have talked about this a couple of times also in our meeting. So it's, we appreciate what you're doing. And like, I'm, like I said, I'm hoping that some more money pops up somewhere and we don't have to do this because we know our number one priority is to keep as much staff in, in these jobs as we can. So thank you. Next item on the agenda is approval of the consent agenda for possible action. I move that the Carson City School District Board of Trustees approve the consent agenda as submitted. All right, we have a motion by Stacy, a second by Richard. Any board discussion? Seeing none. Any public comment? Seeing none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Next item on the agenda is informational items. These are for discussion only. I know Mr. Stokes has pointed out the three upcoming um, meetings for um, our potential rezoning for middle school students. And so I would recommend all of us to at least be in attendance to one of those and hear what the citizens have to say. Okay. Uh, next item is requests for future agenda items or topics. Because we brought up a lot of stuff that's going on in the ninth graders with the training for the suicide and and other things that the uh, family planning committee is working on, could we just have an update maybe on what that ninth grade transition class looks like and if it's still effective or if we need to do something else there? Well, and I guess my question with that would be, the health classes also it's it's half health half right. transition so right. does do you want an update on both no, not health uh, well i guess it is kind of the thorough just kind of what the transition class is doing because i'm sure it goes into the health but just so that we have because i still get questions about if it's really effective and useful for our, our ninth graders so trustee wilkie the um Freshman transition class is a semester class and it's paired with another semester class, which is health, uh, so that the master schedule works well for those ninth graders. Do I understand that you want information about both freshman transitions and health or just the freshman just transitions the transition, class? Just the transition class. Okay. Any other future topics? <laughs> All right, seeing none, we will adjourn this meeting at 9.07. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Enjoy a four-day weekend. <laughs>